All right, so let's let's start. Hello, Max. Thank you very much for joining me here. Uh, so, how are you? Hello, you thank meeting? you for having yeah. me. Here with Hi. I'm looking forward to having a chat. Uh, Bitcoin is awesome, and fiat is pretty bad. So yeah, <laughs> let's get uh, zero fiat into 100 Bitcoin. Yeah. So you describe yourself as a sound money agorist. And that's a really great, lovely term. But maybe could you perhaps explain what you mean by sound money agorist? Yeah, so uh, I guess let's start with the last term, and that is agorism or agorist. Um, and that is a combination of three different pillars. Um, it is uh, anarchy, as in no masters, no slaves, uh, but voluntary interaction. Um, then the um, action, which uh, is, of course, like uh, the defining characteristics of what humans are. And we're creatures who act, who remove uneasiness, who solve problems, and who are, are genius entrepreneurs. Uh, that is what, what makes a human a human, is action. Uh, and then finally, the agora, the marketplace. And so this is where uh, individual actors come together and solve problems for each other for mutual benefit and a, a maximum potential increase in capital and therefore um, a satisfaction of problems and reduce of, a reduction of suffering. And so, so that is agorism for me. That is the understanding that, that human actors can, when they collaborate together on a peaceful, voluntary basis, that they can achieve the most delightful things. Right? Uh, and, and then what is sound money? Well, a sound money is, is a medium of exchange that is chosen by the marketplace, right? that is chosen, voluntarily used uh, by individual actors in order to, to improve the efficiency of their agora, their marketplace. Right? Money is obviously essential to human society uh, as it solves all these uh, many problems uh, like the barter problem, the double coincidence of wants, the store of value, property, uh, the transportability across space and time. Um, all, all of these things money solves very elegantly and therefore free people choose to use a money uh, to trade uh, and to, to save and uh, to calculate their prices. Uh, and um, you, you, ca you cannot have a, a, a successful agora if you don't have a sound money. Uh, and you cannot have a sound money if you are not living in a, in a full agora. And uh, that's why I think these, these two things come together so, so splendidly. Um, uh, money is certainly uh, at the core of, of what agorism and freedom is, is about. Yeah, that's a great definition. Thank you. So, yeah, I totally agree uh, that money is very integral to human society working properly because 50% of all transactions is money and the nature of money greatly influences how we just go about uh, like specialization and uh, not losing what we cr actually created in time and space. Yeah, so sound money agorist is a great term for that. Uh, so you are a person who chooses his own kind of money, the sound money, that is Bitcoin. Um, does that mean you no longer use fiat, the state money? Are you fiat free? Um, that's a big question uh, because money is a very broad subject that touches really a, a, a lot of aspects in your life. Um, and I think claiming to be 100% fiat free is a very substantial claim uh, that, is, that is difficult to uphold. Um, it, though it, it is certainly what, what I strive to be, right? I, I, I strive to get fiat, the, the coercive part of, out, out of my interactions with others. And, I, I, um, uh, and the, the, to every extent that I increase that, to, to a greater and greater level that I protected myself uh, uh, from the fiat mindset and, and uh, fiat money, uh, the, the exponentially greater... Uh, I, I think the returns have been for me, um, n n not just in terms of capital, but also in terms of mind share and, and calmness and focus. Um, so yes, I think uh, it, is, uh, it, it is possible to eventually get to zero fiat uh, in everything in your life. And that is certainly a, 
a, a wondrous goal to strive towards, uh, but we um, to to apply it consistently in the here and now is going to be more expensive. Um, uh, so that just means that we will have to. Um, well, if you want some level of convenience, you're going to use some fiat. Uh, but e even that can be done consciously uh, instead of unconsciously. Uh, and uh, reducing the numbers of seconds that you do hold fiat uh, and the quantity of, of fiat that you hold um, uh, is, uh, yes, at, at any marginal step valuable. Like that's that's the great thing. Uh, every shitcoin that, that you get away and every sound money that you stack uh, is a... Uh, it, it is a noticeable difference in your life. Yeah. So, um, how do you decide when to spend fiat and when to spend Bitcoin? Like, um, do you get rid of fiat first, or do you choose to spend Bitcoin, like um, in a sort of altruistic way, where you want to not just pay for a good but uh, show some appreciation, maybe? Or if you could just describe, how do you decide on that? When to spend fiat and when to spend Bitcoin? Um, well, for, for for me, at least in my mind, it's it's basically the the, the same thing, right? I uh, I do denominate my savings in Bitcoin and and hold um, my my savings in Bitcoin, um, and and therefore, whenever I reduce my savings uh, ratio and uh, invest in either production goods or in consumption goods, um, then this is inherently a, a reduction of the number of Bitcoin that I mentally have allocated. Um, and then it's just a question of, uh, let's say, transaction costs, right? Um, if the person wants, uh, like if the merchant wants to have Bitcoin, then, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to sell fiat to uh, save more Bitcoin and then spend the Bitcoin, right? Or I'm, I'm just going to pay directly in Bitcoin. Um, whereas if the, the merchant insists on getting shit thrown in his face uh, and he really wants to get paid in, in fiat, um, and I do have uh, that sa fiat savings available, then sure, I use, I use the fiat savings, but um, most likely it's not going to be enough as my fiat savings are yeah, recklessly low. Um, uh, and, and that means whenever I, I buy something, I, I usually have to account for, for having less Bitcoin than before. Right. And um, that, that in and of itself is a great check on, on your spending patterns. Um, uh, like, do you really need to consume this uh, uh, good now, right? And, and spend your money on that fancy dinner. Um, uh, like that's, you know, it's a lot of sats that might buy you a spaceship in the future. Uh, but, but simultaneously, if you're investing, right? Do you really want to give that random entrepreneur your precious Bitcoin? And do you really think he will return 1.1 Bitcoin, including the interest uh, next year? Um, that's, you know, the, the, those are um, difficult decisions and Bitcoin changes the surroundings uh, of, of your decision-making process tremendously. Yeah, so you sort of mentioned uh, that Bitcoin is your unit of account now. Is, is, is that right? Like you, you basically calculate your wealth in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, y yes, and I mean... Um, that, that the the reason why I'm able to do that is because I have a lot of inflows as well as outflows denominated in Bitcoin, um, uh, meaning I, I charge a fixed price in Bitcoin uh, for my services, um, and uh, th therefore I can calculate the quantity of Bitcoin that I get per customer, a customer, and per estimated customer base per month or something. Um, uh, and the uh, same with expenditures, um, uh, I, I pay most of my contractors uh, if. In some groups, certainly all of my contractors uh, purely in Bitcoin, um, and th that is when when a unit of account uh, starts to fully make sense, mm. right? Uh, uh, you need to have it on, on both sides, uh, and of course, you know, since since all of these are trades, uh, your counterparty needs to be willing to denominate in Bitcoin too. Um, but then, when you are at that stage where where you know, okay, next month I I'm getting one Bitcoin, regardless of of how much fiat that is worth. Um, and I'm spending 0.5 Bitcoin, regardless of, mm. of how much fiat that is worth, um, uh, then you know, sure, that's going to be a profitable month. Um, and th that is that is extremely powerful. Yeah, that's beautiful. So you don't have any more uh, like earnings or revenues in fiat? It's all in Bitcoin now? 
Um, uh, to, to a very large extent. I mean, again, uh, speaking here in 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 uh, exclusives is, is uh, very uh, or pretty unachievable. Uh, but to a large extent, where, wherever I can manage it, and and certainly with with the most important projects, um, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, like the contributors to to free software that that I pay, I, I naturally pay these people in Bitcoin. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I don't think I've ever paid a developer with, with a bank transfer, <laughs> like ever, you know, but I, I, I throw a bunch of Bitcoins at Devso. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And just to be clear, that's in Wasabi Wallet or is that some other project? Um, I mean, in, in Wasabi Wallet, certainly uh, I, I invested a lot of both my time uh, and then also have, since there is a, a also a company developing Wasabi that does earn a profit. And since I was in, involved in that company as well, I did have certain, let's say, budgets uh, to allocate. Um, prime example for this is, for example, the uh, Wasabi Wallet documentation, um, which we had like an ongoing budget of, I think, 0.1 Bitcoin or something uh, back in the days. <laughs> uh, and uh, I just tossed that to whichever anonymous GitHub account fixed my typos, um, you know, and in, in that effort probably. I don't know, paid all 40, 50 different people. Uh, uh, not, not that much, maybe like 30 or something, but um, a, a decent amount of people just for writing the, doc the documentation, you know? And then um, when it comes to more specific uh, software, I think bounties are definitely the way to go. Um, so I, I put out numerous bounties. Um, uh, one, for example, was to, to review the Taproot uh, PR uh, to Bitcoin Core. Um, uh, then... Another one is just, you know, cool, cool apps that I like. Uh, for example, one that recently got picked up is a LM Bits um, extension that handles Jitsi calls, right? So uh, every participant in a Jitsi call gets in a, a, a custodial wallet with LM Bits, uh, and you can just send money from one account to the other every minute that they're speaking uh, or boost them or whatever. And that's been a stuff that I wanted to have since fucking forever. Um, all, all the building blocks are there. Uh, just misses someone to put it together. I'm a noob. I can't code. I can't even do such mm -hmm. a simple task. But uh, I mean, sure, let's couple million sats uh, incentive, and someone's going to do it, and then I'm going to use it, you know, and I'm going to use it professionally, and I'm going to earn a whole bunch more sats than the meager bounty of couple million sats that I, I paid all to the person to build it. You know? Yeah, and beautiful thing about that is uh, anyone from around the globe can apply and can catch that bounty when compared to some bank transfer only a really narrow group of people could apply for that because you wouldn't be able to actually pay them that's beautiful about bitcoin exactly and the cool thing is because this is free and open source like um, people use these tools and and they like them because they're they're useful and they solve a problem for them right but the tools are not perfect obviously uh, as they are speech you know, code is speech and speech is never perfect. So you, you can always solve a problem in a more elegant way. Um, and then the, the, the question is, is then just how do you, um, or, or so these people are already motivated because they use the tool and they want to make it better. Um, and then they just, you know, help you. Uh, and free software, the free software ecosystem has just this incredible amount of, um, yeah, just like philanthropy work, uh, you know, uh, doing the work, investing your scarce time and attention uh, in in order to, to yeah, to, to to improve the situation, right? And, and these people are already that much motivated to, on their own dime, you know, uh, invest their mm -hmm. time to to help you. Um, these are already the best people whom whom you would want to hire, right? They do the work even without getting paid. Like that shows the amount of of dedication to a project, right? And but but then if on top of that, right, you incentivize these people with with Sats, uh, with Bitcoin uh, as a, a token of respect and of gratitude for for the work that they have done, and this is a this is a whole other level of of incentivization, and it, it turns a spontaneous contributor who just fixes a typo into a a long lived contributor. Like the for, prime example here is the very first Wasabi contribution game that we organized was, I believe, a, a one Bitcoin bounty for just lines of code committed to the repository. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we shilled it hard and, and a couple people uh, just, you know, stuck around start or, or they, they started to contribute for that. Um, and like this one guy, Yahia, he just, you know, fixed a whole bunch of stuff. 
um, in, in that month, and he earned like a substantial amount of, of sats. And and but now three years later, he is still a, a core contributor to the Wasabi project, um, and and now actually maintaining um, uh, like repositories and and really helping out tremendously. And right? so that person got got uh, convinced to start working um, for the financial gains. Right? But then he he was so committed a committed user before that, right? and then uh, just stuck around and. Uh, like stories like this are are why I love free software so much, and it, it just shows you how how in, incredibly impressive problems we can solve with it. Yeah, yeah, it's so, so cool. Um, and this sort of touches on one topic I wanted to discuss with you: uh, wielding Bitcoin, wielding versus just hardling Bitcoin. Because there was this article, wielding Bitcoin, uh, that came out in. Uh, Citadel 21 in September by Nico Lamanen, and uh, it discussed that just simple hodling uh, doesn't bring about necessary societal change. And you seem to agree a lot with this article. So, are you like um, how do you how do you perceive just hodling by people? Do you think that's not enough, and we should like do more with our Bitcoin? It's certainly a, a big and important part of it, right? To protect your your savings, uh, your your liquid capital, um, and to deny that capital f for thieves that might steal it. Uh, that is already a substantial impact. Um, uh, just protecting your savings, right? But uh, obviously, that's that's not enough. Um, the the root of money is the medium of exchange, right? Uh, you only hold the money. Uh, because you know that in the future you can pay an entrepreneur to solve a problem for you. Right? That's the only reason why you hold money um, and why why it is a suitable store of value, because you know in the future you can liquidate it. Um, and that means that, um, or and an additional angle is that money is neither a consumption good nor a production good. Right? So you cannot eat money like you can a piece of steak. Or you cannot build a wood, a, a house out of money like you could from a piece, a log of wood, and so. Um, yeah. uh, but you use money in order to coordinate your choices in consumption and production, right? You 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 throughout the very complex production stages, right, where you need to create a saw. Uh, and and get on the the log and cut it and um, like smoothen it out and put nails in it and whatnot. All of these complex production stages each have a cost. Right? Mm -hmm. And the big question is, can you can you solve your problem um, in a way that that it doesn't cost you too much? Right? That the the benefits that you get out of that outweigh the cost that you sacrifice to create um, uh, whichever thing that you want to produce. Um, and uh, that's so important because if, if you're not profitable, you're just eating yourself. It's cannibalism, right? Um, or, or no, well, cannibalism is eating others. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what eating yourself is, um, but, <laughs> but autophagy, I, I believe, autophagy, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, go on. Yeah. So, so the the reason why we have money is to coordinate uh, human actors. Uh, across incredibly complex and nuanced and long and roundabout production stages, and right? so um, th that is that is why we we use money, right? Is to produce stuff more efficiently, um, and uh, so just holding money—that's jack shit, right? Uh, we we only hold money because we want to produce things. Um, mm. So the the real reason uh, or the 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 real purpose shouldn't be just to to accumulate more Bitcoin. Like I mean, sure, it's it's a nice number and and it's a cool game that you can play, you know. But ultimately, ask yourself why four times. And if your answer is still because I want to have a higher number out of twenty one million, then I, I like I encourage you to rethink your 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 meaning process and to find a, a goal that might be more fulfilling in life. Um, uh, well, but so so ultimately, if if your goal is uh, like after you ask yourself four times why, and your goal is to you know raise a, a good family and to uh, be uh, admired and respected in the community and uh, to to um, increase uh, the prosperity or decrease the suffering of of all humankind things like that right if that is what you want to achieve well great 
holding Bitcoin won't get you there. You actually need to move your ass uh, and and to work uh, because <laughs> problems won't solve themselves uh, by by nothing, right? You you need to apply your your human genius to the problem and your human action to manifest the solution. And so uh, this this is why the the full power of Bitcoin. Um, even so, even though holding Bitcoin is already in, incredibly powerful, it is it is but a glimmer of of what what this technology can actually do for you if you wield it properly. If you if you don't just uh, see it as a number uh, go up system, but if you really see like how can I solve the most deepest problems for for the largest quantity of humans here? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, like one problem for most people with that is they still have like the majority of their wage or earnings in fiat and they sort of naturally choose to spend fiat first and save bitcoin but like in your case it's quite different because you don't uh, earn any fiat or almost no fiat uh, anymore so uh, like i believe what people need right now in most countries around the world is the store of value function of money because uh, like in Czech Republic, United States, Germany, the medium of exchange function of money kind of works. It, it works. It doesn't maybe work for Salvadorans when they want to uh, perform some remittance payments, but it works for us now here. Uh, so it's kind of hard for me to like get on board uh, just spending bitcoin if if i can just get rid of fiat money first and i still have a lot of inflows of fiat well the, the question is um, if, if you're in that position right the bitcoin goes to the moon um then why the hell are you still holding on to any fiat and right? you should sell it <laughs> instantly for bitcoin sure. and then you realize for well, sure okay, i no longer have fiat i, I gotta spend bitcoin right there's no alternative right so if you want to be in the full benefit of the opportunity cost that is holding bitcoin and then that uh, that just means that well, you have to spend it if you want to eat, <laughs> if hmm. you want to get shelter, uh, if if uh, you want to go out and have fun. You know that's that's when you spend money to solve your problems. And uh, again, like money is not the the end all be all. It's a means to an end. And right? uh, you need to figure out the ends that you really want to do. Like w what problems do you want to solve? Um, and and once you figure out th that meaning in life, so to say. Um, then you use money as a technology to get it there, and and and, and I, I'm not saying that that using money now, uh, Bitcoin now as a uh, store of value primarily is is a bad thing. Not at all. Again, it it already that has an has an incredible impact, and many people feel that impact alone uh, to a massive extent. And right? but if if you go even deeper down the rabbit hole, um, and you go more than all in. Um, I mean, out of personal experience, like it's 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 ineffable. Similarly to how a good dose of mushrooms or LSD is ineffable, like it's hmm. it's it's a, it's a truly different experience and worldview. Um, and uh, it, it's for sure a fun ride, right? But uh, it, it, all I'm I'm saying is it doesn't stop at just savings. Right? Hmm. Um, yeah. a, a good money goes so much deeper. Yeah. So part of the strategy to basically wield bitcoin is to just get to zero fiat or just try to have uh, most revenues in bitcoin and then you are sort of forced to use bitcoin and basically level up from just stacking and handling bitcoin yeah yeah exactly and it's also a matter of respect to the people that you're working with right because you understand the scam of fiat and, and you understand how, how beautiful of a solution Bitcoin is. That's why you're here. Um, so if you have that level of understanding and then you turn around and to uh, the butcher who cuts your meat, you know, you you give him the, that funny money, you know, that, that <laughs> worthless piece of shit that, that you're very much conscious of. It is a piece of shit, right? Um, and, and even worse, the butcher might not even know it, right? He might not have gone through the rabbit hole and actually done all the reading required to understand this, right? Um, so you're basically offloading a, a highly toxic waste on this unsuspecting individual now, uh, and, and you know of the risk that that will put him and his family in. And that, that just for me doesn't sit well. 
like I respect the people who solve problems for me and I want to show them that respect and that gratitude. Um, and I don't do that with, with shit money. Uh, I, I do that with the most precious resource that I own uh, and that is Bitcoin. Yeah, so, so you touched on like the local butcher. Uh, so do you just go around like uh, orange peeling, like ordinary people or just people you do business with even if it's not like software developers but your like local butcher and how successful are you in this regard um that's certainly somewhat of a personal mission right just um uh, and it's something that i've been that i've been doing for a long time uh to a of course initially very bad success rate because i barely understood what bitcoin is so i couldn't really sell it so to say um and also that many people did not perceive the need for it, right? Because at least in the past, the need was quite theoretical. Hmm. Um, and I think we've uh, we've uh, improved on these things tremendously as an ecosystem, where not just do we have better understanding and better explanations of what Bitcoin is, and but on the other side, people perceive the need of, of Bitcoin much greater because they start to feel how the, the current fiat system is just... Uh, shady <laughs> and yeah. they might not get why but they get now that there is something going on um, and whenever there is a perceived problem uh, humans will look for for solutions mm. and we have now put bitcoin in a position that it's not just a viable solution which it was since 2009 uh, but now it is a well documented a well explained solution where where the cost of using the tool has drastically decreased uh, and and the the cost to the attacker against an individual wielding this tool of Bitcoin, uh, th that cost has increased tremendously. Um, uh, just just think where we are now with, with multi-sig and backup solutions and uh, all the fancy shit that we can do. Um, th like, good luck stealing the, the fats of a well-protected Bitcoiner. Yeah, and <laughs> the well-protected part is quite, quite a key in that because uh, sadly still a lot of people just hold their Bitcoin on exchanges. And maybe maybe that's, uh, that's a, another good topic. Like, uh, how do we convince people that it really matters to hold their own keys? Because like the store of value function itself, they can get that when they are on an exchange, basically. But... It's kind of hard to explain that uh, something can happen and that, for example, a government can confiscate that because they just cannot uh, imagine something like that could happen in a civilized country, even though it happened in 1933 and uh, many times over in other countries, other places. What's your, what's your like... Uh, Elevator pitch for self custody. Um, I mean, what's following is not an elevator pitch, but a long rant, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I think one thing to highlight uh, is that um, there's nothing wrong with banking. Uh, banking is an incredibly valuable solution to a very difficult problem, and and um, the the problem is basically uh, risk and time. Um, these are the two things that are very subjective uh, for every individual, right? These are subjective problems, subjective solutions, where individuals have different preferences throughout, N not just across individuals, but even across one individual across time. Um, and hmm. banking is just an entrepreneurial solution uh, to those problems, right? So in, in terms of money warehousing, uh, meaning in the old example, you have a physical gold coin, right? the bearer instrument, money-based asset, without counterparty risk right? and and you control it but of course a five dollar wrench you know and uh you just give up the gold coin um and uh, therefore you uh you collaborate with an entrepreneur to provide a service of secure storage of your monetary good right vaulting so to say uh the entrepreneur has a secure vault somewhere protected with guns and skilled people um, and uh, you trust that he can take better care of your gold coin than you can. And, and the same logic definitely applies in Bitcoin, right? They're, um, uh, holding Bitcoin is cumbersome and it is a barrier asset. And if you fuck up and you make mistakes, uh, there is no recourse, right? Um, uh, uh, so 
this is a cost, this is a risk, right? There is a demurrage cost to holding Bitcoin, right? You need to buy yourself a hardware wallet probably if you want to do it right. Uh, that's a cost, right? You need to spend on-chain transaction fees. That's a cost, right? So there is still demurrage cost to holding Bitcoin yourself. Um, and if you want to do it more optimally, maybe you want to collaborate with, with uh, an entrepreneur uh, to do that for you. And right? uh, if you're not skilled at it, if, if you perceive that the risk of you losing the money is greater um, than the risk of the counterparty screwing you over, then sure, right? But, but notice that this is an individual decision uh, and that there is no good or bad. Um, this is a preference. Um, and in the free market, we will see all of this flourish. And I mean, Bitcoin is to a large extent a free market and we see a lot of custodial wallets. Right? And we see people building them and we see people uh, using them uh, without the threat of force. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. Right? Um, however, you need to be, of course, cautious of the risks. Right? So that the risk being mainly, um, it's no longer your gold coin right? or you no longer possess it and you no longer have control over it. Uh, and so either if that third party denies you access to the safe, just says, no, bye bye, uh, uh, you no longer get into the safe. Um, well, you're screwed, right? Or, of course, if someone breaks into the safe, that central honeypot, uh, and takes out all the gold coins. You know, and the same can happen in Bitcoin, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Denial of service and theft. And both have occurred uh, with, with money warehouses ex extensively, right? So the, the risk was there in gold and the risk is there in Bitcoin. And so this is not a silver bullet solution, right? Uh, uh, these Bitcoin warehouses uh, or custodial wallets, um, but they do work for to some extent. Now, how do we go about dealing this problem, right? And here the cypherpunk strategy comes in, right? Um, mm. Decrease the cost of uh, self-sovereign um, tools, um, especially those tools that increase the cost of attack, right? So again, we decrease cost of defense, we increase cost of attack. I think that's the gist of the cypherpunk philosophy. Uh, and if we do that, we will see a tremendous outcome, right? So if, uh, you know, instead of needing to buy a clean, laptop uh, and boot a new operating system on it and encrypt it and make sure it's good, right? Which costs you, uh, you know, like a lot. Um, you just buy a Trezor uh, and, you know, everything comes pre-configured and that's much cheaper than before, right? We can, we can decrease the demurrage cost of holding Bitcoin. Um, and uh, user experience, of course, is another uh, cost. Right? If it is cumbersome to use a software, if you um, can make a lot of costly mistakes by misusing the software and uh, the proper use is not well documented, um, that increases the cost and the risk uh, of, of being self-sovereign, right? So our job as, as tool makers, as weaponsmiths, uh, is to, to build better tools uh, where users can't shoot themselves in the foot, where, where privacy and sovereignty is, is the default uh, and the user-friendly and the cheap thing to do. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're getting more and more to that stage. I think we've we've done tremendous progress over the years, uh, but but still there's there's no limit to to how much further we can um, tip the balances here and increase uh, the cost of attack and decrease the cost of defense. Yeah, that was a beautiful rant on self custody. <laughs> Thank you for that. So that said, uh, could you maybe describe uh, Wasabi 2.0? What are you working on right now? Uh, What's the difference between Wabi Sabi and, uh, and Zero Link, like the two uh, protocols of uh, CoinJoin? And when can we expect Wasabi 2.0 and what's going to be different for, for the end user there? Yeah, to jump off from the previous point, uh, the, the goal of Wabi Sabi and Wasabi 2.0 is to decrease the demurrage cost of spending Bitcoin privately. Right? Uh, or of using Bitcoin privately more generally. And so that basically means we want to be in a world where you can receive Bitcoin and later you can spend Bitcoin and neither the receiver, uh, like neither the person who sent you the money originally knows where you spent it, nor the person who knows where you, uh, whom you spent the money to knows where you got it from. Right? And that the, the cost and the effort of doing that, both in terms of uh, user experience, uh, as, as well as in the very real cost of, of block space uh, and, and mining fee paid for, for transactions, that that uh, is to be reduced. Um, and I, I, that is uh, a very challenging uh, task in and of, its, in and of per se. 
Uh, so over the last couple of years, we were researching and, and refining uh, on, on how to make that happen. Um, and uh, where we started was with the uh, uh, coin join protocol in and of itself, uh, which is a corner piece of, of Wasabi Wallet from, from the first. Um, and think of a coin join uh, as a collaborative Bitcoin transaction. And so instead of you all forever alone in, in the basement, uh, sitting there putting you know one input in your in a transaction and two outputs, and uh, so the input being the coin that you spent, a coin that you received in the past, and, and then the output addresses uh, being the destinations of where you're sending the money to. And then you can make that, right? A one input, a two output transaction. You sign it, you broadcast it, you pay the mining fee, it gets in a block, everyone verifies it, the money got sent, perfect, right? But uh, of course the problem is, um, wh why do it uh, alone, especially when it is public, right? And um, whenever you're alone, you're, you're, you're not in a crowd, right? You're sticking out like a sore thumb um, and uh, anonymity likes company. Uh, meaning if if more people look the same, uh, every one of them has a higher privacy per se, uh, a higher anonymity set, so to say. Um, and uh, the the idea of a coin join is then to just you know not be solo when making a Bitcoin transaction, but working together with hundreds of others of users uh, to collaboratively build a transactions that has, let's say three hundred inputs and four hundred outputs. and and uh, that's still a valid Bitcoin transaction. You know everyone can sign it. Uh, and uh, if the mining fee is paid, it gets included in a block and voila, um, it's, it's good. Everyone made his payment, right? Uh, of course, the big problem is, right? Uh, if, if we are now hundreds of people, um, probably anonymous over Tor, um, how, uh, so with no reputation, right? How, how, do we, how, how do we solve or how do we basically get consensus um, uh, on, on which transaction to sign? Um, and uh, that's a very difficult problem. Uh, there are decentralized ways of solving this consensus problem. And, um, uh, for example, CoinJoin, uh, uh, sorry, CoinShuffle and CoinShuffle++ are decentralized CoinJoin protocols where you coordinate the signing, the consensus mechanism of, of which transaction to sign in a decentralized fashion. Super complex, bit of crazy cryptography and, and not very efficient. Um, uh, and so we stuck with a, a centralized approach. And we, we just solve, like we skip the Byzantine generals problem of, of distributed consensus. We just say this is a, a single trusted third party. And that trusted third party is going to act as, let's say, a whiteboard in cyberspace. Right? This, this public whiteboard where anyone can come and write an input uh, on the whiteboard. Right? I want to spend that coin. And, and, and uh, later, on the, on the, everyone goes to the same whiteboard and everyone puts his, his input there. And then everyone puts his output there, and right? I want to pay this address that much Bitcoin. Um, and uh, because we all write on the same single whiteboard, it gets pretty easy to find out the final transaction. Uh, and we can make it in a way that everyone can verify uh, that your input is there, your output is there. Great. Um, you're, you're not losing money when signing this transaction. And you're, you're just the payments that you want to make. Um, and uh, that... Um, so th basically this means we can now, um, and uh, with our old zero link coin join coordination protocol, think of it as this old rusty, you know, uh, scratch board where people, you know, scratch in their, their inputs and outputs. Uh, it had a lot of constraints um, in the sense that, for example, when you register multiple inputs, when you uh, write multiple inputs uh, on this coin join whiteboard, um, like one identity walks to the whiteboard and writes six inputs on the list right and everyone can at least the coordinator but certainly other people as well can later find out uh, that one person just put six inputs there right? uh, and whereas with, with wabi sabi um, because of the crypto magic that we use um, uh, like everyone walks to the whiteboard and just writes their one input and then you walk away and then the next person right a new tour identity different mustache uh, he walks there and writes another input and walks away. Right? So, so everyone just writes one input there and nobody knows which different people uh, like wrote all of these different inputs. Like uh, nobody knows if one person had multiple inputs there. And same for the outputs. And right? so, so that means that this whiteboard is now more private to write to in a, in a sense that you can write multiple inputs there without other people knowing that all these multiple inputs or multiple outputs belong to you. And, and um, another big uh, um, 
restriction of the old CoinJoin coordination protocol zero link uh, was that it required that everyone had the exact same value output um, uh, size. So everyone needed to have exactly 0 0.101234 Bitcoin on the output side. And kind of the, the coordinator had a pre-configured uh, value for the outputs already scratched in the whiteboard. And you can only come in and put uh, uh, come to the whiteboard and type in your address. Um, and that's another big hurdle that, that makes it more difficult, more cumbersome to use a coin join. Um, if if you don't have freedom in writing exactly the output that you want. And, and so that, again, is upgraded with Wabi Sabi, uh, where now the coordinator is just an empty whiteboard and you can write whatever you want. And so you can choose uh, whatever address you want to. You can choose what and you can choose whichever amount you want to add there. And um, and again, because of the fancy cryptography that we use, um, uh, like we can still make this a trustless and secure protocol that is um, very expensive to attack uh, and very cheap to use. Um, so to, to sum this up, um, uh, because we have now um, increased the privacy of the CoinJoin protocol and we increase the flexibility of the amounts organization in the CoinJoins, um, we can now have a infinitely more block space efficient, higher privacy guarantees. Um, uh, and that is very noticeable for the user, especially in terms of fees. And whereas before, let's say you have 10 Bitcoin uh, and you want to get them private. So you just receive 10 Bitcoin from, from your customer right? and you want to make it private before you send it out to your suppliers again. Right? Um, and uh, if you would use Wasabi 1.0 with the old zero link coin join coordinator, um, you would end up with 100 different UTXOs worth uh, uh or let's say 95 different utxos worth 0 0.101 roughly that value and so you splinter your one single coin into at least 100 uh, smaller ones that have at least some level of privacy right but then you also have a bunch of change outputs and uh, because the coordinator pre uh, described the the amounts um uh, which you don't even have privacy guarantee. So in total, maybe your wallet now has 300 UTXOs, right? 300 chunks of Bitcoin. And you needed to spend a minor fee in order to create those inputs, and you need to spend minor fees in order to, to spend those coins again. And so that's a very expensive fashion. And because it's so expensive, um, we, we cannot do it by default for everyone. Right. But contrarily, in, in Wabi Sabi, if you start with a single 10 Bitcoin output, you might get, end up with like three different outputs, you know, um, uh, uh, all of them just with, with uh, the right size so that you could spend, let's say, 75 percent of your wallet balance in a single transaction privately. You know, and you do that efficiently after a single or maybe two rounds of coin drop. Um And you see just that the difference between, you know, creating 300 coins versus creating maybe five coins um, to to what extent that actually makes it a lot more private uh, especially for for wealthier people with let's say more than one bitcoin um, but simultaneously for for the small folks who have less than 10 million sats uh, the cool thing is we can also reduce the minimum amount uh, to coin join drastically from currently 10 million sats to probably something as low as a thousand or ten thousand sets at the dust hold uh, limit, probably something like that. Um, so th the end result, uh, to close a very long rant, is that we can now create collaborative transactions among hundreds of users um, at at perfect privacy um, uh, and at uh, a very efficient um, uh, transaction graph structure, so that users pay very little fees to get a substantial amount of privacy. Um, for both smaller and larger amounts with, uh, uh, while paying uh, less in fees. So, uh, and we can automate a lot of this process in the background uh, so that the end user experience is someone pays you 10 Bitcoin, right? A day later, you want to send six Bitcoin to a supplier, right? But in the meantime, the wallet automatically did a couple rounds of coin join, preparing your wallet to be fully private uh, so that you can spend these uh, 0.6 Bitcoin or six Bitcoin or whatever, um, on your supplier, knowing that uh, he cannot trace you back. He cannot find out that you actually earned 10 Bitcoin in the past. And, um, and 
uh, the this is a net benefit uh, in the sense of way better user experience, way lower transaction costs, um, and uh, that that just means a, a plus a higher privacy. So we decrease the cost of defense and we increase the cost of attack, yeah. uh, and that is Wasabi 2.0 in a pretty big nutshell. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love the term automagically. <laughs> is Wasabi 2.0 going to work automagically? Like you don't have to uh, join the coin join round. It's going to just uh, do its thing on its own all the time. Is that it? Like like coin joining when you have when you have uh, UTXOs in the wallet. Uh, that is certainly the goal. Uh, yes. Uh, it is a difficult one to achieve um, because we are dealing here inherently with um, individual preferences which are subjectively different. And um, uh, the wallet cannot know uh, how much the user wants to spend on fees, right? Or how how much he um, uh, how much he wants to pay in the future, right? Or uh, things like this. Like if we really want to provide this automated user experience, we need to make very smart decisions. Um, uh, on behalf of the user without decreasing his wallet balance or uh, shredding him in a, a false sense of security. Um, and that's extremely difficult and we're, we're still actively working on it. Um, but I'm, I'm confident that we, we can solve it. Um, and uh, at this point, I think it's just um, like we've, we've proven that it's, it's possible. Um, on, on numerous conjoins on testnet. Um, at this point, it's just a optimization, um, which currently still brings substantial improvements. Um, so in terms of when could we release uh, Wasabi 2.0, I, I mean, you know, the code is on GitHub, <laughs> like has always been. Uh, so you can just run it. Uh, you can run it on mainnet if you're crazy. Um, uh, so, uh, but it's, um, it's it's not yet at a point where where we feel comfortable to actually put it out on on mainnet properly, um, and um, uh, yeah, it's it's just um... yeah, sure. I see. Uh, we had one request to join in the discussion, so but I don't see it anymore. So if somebody wants to join and ask some questions about coin joins or wasabi let's you can do so all right anyway i hope i didn't just looked off can you hear me still max still here yes yeah yeah cool so uh, maybe could you describe uh, your upcoming book yeah, so um, I'm an economist by heart and, and before Bitcoin, uh, specifically the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, and uh, that the, the main differentiating factor of the school of thought is a, a focus on, on uh, praxeology, uh, which is uh, literally the, the logic of human action. Um, and uh, that is, uh, I think, a very relevant and applicable uh, economic theory that can improve your life uh, on, on many levels, not just personally, but also on, on a business level. Um, and uh, there has been, you know, I, I was at this point where in the past I was reading Austrian economics uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I understood, you know, money and, and the economy and I understood that fiat money was a scam. But I was devastated and depressed because I I thought gold was the best thing we had, <laughs> yeah. and and I, and I also understood why why gold failed, uh, and I didn't see a good solution to it, and and um, what then kind of hit me on a blind spot is is eventually the the cypherpunk philosophy, right? and and the crypto anarchist uh, ideals uh, to increase the cost of attack, decrease the cost of defense, right? To write the tools that have individual sovereignty enshrined as their first principles. Um, and, and who are therefore inc incredibly useful tools for human actors, uh, and and especially with censorship resistant tools and decentralized networks, uh, where where the usage of this tool cannot be denied, where where censorship is literally infinitely expensive, um, uh, that is just that's a breathtaking solution 
to the problem of the state uh, and of institutionalized violence. Um, and uh, that is really what, what makes me extremely hopeful. Um, and then I, I went deeper into discovering like, you know, the free, so uh, free software ethos and the way that this incredibly complex software can be written um, and f fell in love with those ideas understanding the first principles of Austrian economics and, and their conclusions. Right? And I, I just saw um, on, on so many fractal levels similarities uh, where the, the two different things were, or, or our schools were talking about the same problem from a different angle. Uh, and when, when looking at both of them, they align just so, so beautifully. Right? And um, then one thing that really, that I learned from the cypherpunks is the value of privacy. Um, and uh, just the way that privacy is framed as the choice to reveal yourself to the world, right? And, um, and that is so presciently relevant in today's cyberspace um, that that you know the cypherpunks of the '90s uh, have have so eloquently already like foreseen this um, and already given us this strong argumentation and the strong way of thinking in cyberspace. Um, that uh, that th th this again, I mean, a lot of cypherpunks were Austrian economics, right? Who who understood uh, economics from that point of view, and I think it helped them a lot to articulate the cypherpunk concept. But there is there, there is not as much overlap in the actual writings. You know, Austrian economists don't really talk about privacy all that much. Um, I mean, sure they do, but uh, and, and when they do, they're usually on point. But it's not a main focus of them, of, of theirs, right? And, and same with with uh, cypherpunks, right? I mean, the mailing list is not really full of economic treatises. I mean, sure they are there, and the people who write economic stuff on the cypherpunk mailing lists usually are spot on, right? But the main focus is on building uh, technology and software and, and encryption. Um, and um, I I just think that these two different schools of thoughts are so perfectly aligned, and that when um, th that we can build a unified treaties like a, a whole way of looking at the world that encompasses both of these somewhat separate um ways of looking at the world right we we combine the praxeological rigor of starting with the axiom of human action uh, and logically uh, verbally deducing certain principles from that starting point um to to use that method to talk about privacy and software uh, and what it means uh, to uh, what encryption means on a on a uh, human action level uh, and how why it is useful what what problem uh, it, it basically solves um, so uh, w with of course bitcoin being that crowning achievement right to to use non-scarce uh, digital information uh, that uh, in a way to, to create scarcity of a, a resource that can be allocated across humans. It's, uh, it's, it's such a mind-boggling um, culmination of, uh, of both the cypherpunks and the Austrians uh, that I think we, yeah, we, we just need to put all of that together in a single treatise covering all of these aspects from the ground up. Um, and I think if... Um, I think that would be very helpful, not just for the cypherpunks, but also for the Austrian economists. Uh, and I think when, when bridging that gap and when getting both people from, from both sides of the camp interested in the other one, um, uh, in a way that actually resonates with them and with their current understanding of the world, uh, that's a very interesting and worthwhile endeavor. Uh, so that's why I've been contemplating to write this book for a long time. Um, a lot of it is, is, of course, you know, pre-thinking it and coming on podcasts and spaces and, and talking about all of this. Um, so a lot of that work is done, but actually sitting down uh, focusedly and, and putting it down on paper and editing it and making sure it's coherent as a whole uh, is a whole other task. Uh, so for that is uh, currently a fundraiser up in uh, like a somewhat Kickstarter, uh, self-hosted on a BTC pay at towardsliberty.com slash pop. A P.O.P. or slash praxeology of privacy, a current title of the book, very convoluted and very not appealing, uh, but that writs out the, the people who, who <laughs> might uh, misunderstand it. So this is really going to be a, a nice treatise focused on first principles, uh, all about individual sovereignty and Bitcoin. 
Yeah, I, I love it. Just uh, this overlap of Austrian economics and cypherpunk. I would love to see this published like as soon as possible. So everybody just uh, please try to contribute to this book because this will be a masterpiece, as you say. So we've got a Nopara here as a speaker. Uh, did you want to chime in on Wasabi World? Hey guys, yes, I wanted to chime in the Wasabi topic uh, that was before, but I think people really enjoyed this one. So maybe I just pick up from here and I, I have a question. So what did the cypherpunks figure out that Austrian economists and libertarians didn't? That's a great question. Um, I think it is about discovering, uh, creating applicable tools uh, that that enshrine those the, the property rights um, and the, the the human will uh, in a unbreakable form. Um, you know, in, instead of the Austrian saying, "Oh, you can own a piece of paper," you know, you can produce it yourself, or, or or you can buy it from someone voluntarily, and then it's yours, and then you can choose, you know, to to write certain letters on that piece of paper. Right? And you can you can seal it and and you can send it off, right? And and if someone would intercept it and and break open you know the seal and uh, uh, like read it, th th that would be bad, right? And you can go to a court and kind of punish the crime after the fact, right? Of someone stealing your physical paper, right? Um, uh, uh, and so Austrians, like um, on on one hand, they describe the the economics of of why stealing people's paper is a bad idea and why it will lead to a net negative instead of a net positive. Um, and, and on the other hand, uh, you know, North Bardian ethics would, would uh, prescribe theft as, as being bad and, and a morally bad thing to do. Um, but what, what the cypherpunks kind of honed on is like, um, I mean, w sure, let, let other people catch our paper, you know, um, but... Uh, we just prepare for the worst, you know. We we have an entire ceremony that is um, designed in a way that any single system, like if any single system breaks or any single part of the system breaks, uh, that the whole entirety is is still ongoing, right? We have reliance, um, uh, redundancy, and resiliency, um, and that this is enshrined in the actual code itself. And so, uh, think of it. Think of encryption, for example. You know, like in, instead of telling people, "Hey, please don't steal my paper," and if you do, I'm going to come after you. Right? You just send out hundreds of papers, and, and all of them just have gibberish on them, and 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 you need to get to like I don't know, 80 out of 90 papers so that you can decipher. Plus, you need to know an, an additional secret before you can decipher the message, and then only then can you read it. Right? And if you set up such a ceremony in a logically sound way um, then the cost of breaking or, or the cost or, or the likelihood of that um, ceremony breaking is in, 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 the cost is high the likelihood is low um, and uh, that that just works you know it's it's a it's a practical um, action to to stop theft um, and that is kind of what the Austrian school was was missing, I think, um, uh, and it, it didn't even strive to 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 do that, right? It, this is about explaining the theory um, uh, and the causal consequences of human action and and the ethics that we can deduce from that. Um, but it's it's not as much about strategy and how to actually achieve that. Um, and this is the the new building block of the cypherpunks, right? They they take a lot of the Austrian um, theory and they say uh, okay so how can we build something that is in accordance to that theory um because is if it is in accordance to the theory then there is a, a higher likelihood of the tool actually working and and being useful um and maybe to a greater or lesser extent that decision was was made consciously um or, or not but for, for sure in hindsight there, there are obvious um similarities so 
Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, no bar. So, 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 is it about, uh, or my intuition is saying that also that it's it's about enforcement or con on, of contracts, um, right? The Austrian economists figured out that contracts and property rights are important, and the cypherpunks figure out how to actually enforce those things, even if it's a very limited form online, but. They figured out these enforcements and maybe, maybe let's call them smart contracts or 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 the the point is that the parties don't really have to trust each other in order to interact or trade in some way or in a form it's this untrusted third parties are security who was uh nick sabo stuff it's the it's the Google figured out that, hey, don't be evil. And cypherpunks say, uh, uh uh, can't be evil. Build systems where you cannot be evil. And that's the ultimate enforcement of contracts. Um, it, it, exactly, yes. And, and, and on the terms of contracts, right? Whereas Austrians like Rothbard would have said that, um, like, yes, we do need a strong court system and, and it is the right thing to have it and uh we need to make sure that as a society we uh we we have the shared mindset that uh contracts are punished uh, or sorry are enforced and people who break contracts are punished at, uh, across the society and um i think um w w whereas uh but also austrians would would say like the details of how the market like the details of how that problem of of enforcement of contract is is done is up to the free market and many austrians always say that we we couldn't imagine what what the free market comes up with uh, in the sense of some genius entrepreneur will figure out some cool solution based on some other insights from other geniuses right um and uh and encryption and and smart contracts is exactly that like you know murray rothbard has never the one of the greatest economists ever living you know, he never even used a computer. Like to his dying date, he, he he wrote on a typewriter. You know, so the, as analog as as it could be, right? Um, and th that's exactly it, right? He he in he laid the foundation of the reasoning why a court system or why private property contracts are so important and why a court system is so important, right? Um, but he could never see the genius of uh, uh like inside of 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 a smart contract, right? Of an automatically predictably a, a machine uh, uh, like contract that just works uh, a, and uh, allocates property like that is a very that is a substantial innovation in property rights theory uh, that were definitely or like not predicted or not as well fleshed out as, as it could have been by the Austrians. Um, but that just shows the the genius of the early cypherpunks, right? They they really applied the theory, uh, and uh, and yeah, I mean, just look at what the cypherpunks built, right? Like if if your action is in alignment to good theory, like you're gonna build something as beautiful as the internet, right? Or as beautiful as Bitcoin, uh, it's it's really something. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, and if anybody else wants to join in the discussion, let's raise your hand. Um, but maybe for the final kind of topic, I would like to discuss uh, this idea of Bitcoin rabbit hole and how deep does it go? Because um, I was thinking if it's even possible to understand Bitcoin in all its aspects and all its consequences, because uh, there's mining, economics of Bitcoin, fiat currencies, uh, monetary history, monetary politics, security and privacy, cryptography, lightning network. Max, maybe what do you focus on lately yourself and what do you recommend newcomers to focus on from these wide, wide array of fields that touch on Bitcoin? Bitcoin really is a massive fractal. Uh, it has unlimited surface area, and you can get lost in it. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certain that there is no bottom to the rabbit hole. Uh, Bitcoin is such a interdisciplinary force, um, and it is 
uh, another reason is, is that it's just um you know money is so inherently tied to to humans um and uh, because well, humans are ever changing right they 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 choose and they act and and they they do it in all types of weird ways that you cannot really predict um and that uh, that makes the experience of money a very nuanced one you know uh, and, and money is different things to different people again because money is not the end goal right uh, uh, money is a means to an end uh, and a good money lets you achieve higher ends right? and uh, and so like we're just getting started on trying to grasp what bitcoin is per se like as a technology uh, but where we're just you know barely glimpsing the impact is is how bitcoin changes uh, human action um and and how it impacts humans and and how uh, and the, the the things that humans create after their first contact in bitcoin um th th that is something that you know, is is just another order of magnitude of complexity. Um, so, yeah, how, how do you deal with all of that potential? Um, I mean, first of it, first of all, like have fun, um, because there's a lot of fun to be had here. Um, uh, it's it's uh, and you know, don't forget that. Like, um, and um, as a general tip, know know what you're in for. Not just I want more money, but what do you want to do with that money? Um, and I think you will learn that throughout your exposure to Bitcoin, the answer to that question will dramatically shift. Um, so kind of keep track of that. I think that's a nice uh, uh, progress. Um, and then keep it uh, actionable. Like uh, the, the, the theory of Bitcoin is infinite. Um, uh, the, and the practice of Bitcoin is infinite too. But uh, like at, at least um, I, I think that's one of the good uh, aspects of of the free software ethos is to scratch your own itch right that um just use the tools like that that solve the problems for you uh and and stay on the lookout for continuously better tools that solve more difficult problems for you in a more elegant way um and learn more about those tools and and, and learn more about other tools that that and and figure out what for which problems they were designed for uh and and maybe they they will solve then like maybe you will discover that that's an actual problem for you right so i don't know if, if all the bitcoiners are talking about hardware wallets and you don't have one yet well maybe think about why a hardware wallet might be useful you know why so many people have it um and then maybe consider uh you know uh, uh if you find out okay no actually having a dedicated computer to keep my secret sounds like a good idea especially if it's offline and right? um uh, then sure go go out and get one right and grow in that area um but but um if, if you you don't have to stop um and that's both a good thing and a bad thing like uh you the thing is you can drain a lot of energy into bitcoin uh and, and continue discovering it um and i mean you know as as a person having done that basically full time for a long time now um Sure, it's a very fun ride, but uh, you know there, there's also other stuff uh, and and friends and family, um, and uh, it's it's easy to get lost in cool tools um, and forget the reason why we actually use them. Um, so yeah, stay stay relevant, uh, stay on track, and use Bitcoin as a tool rather than as an end goal. Yeah, that's a beautiful take, and. That's something we should always remember that Bitcoin and money itself is just a tool and we should sort of make up our mind what are the real end goals here. Exactly, right? And, and you know, not everyone has to specialize on, on building a certain tool. And I mean, um, sure, like you're talking here like on the faces with people who, who do build the tools um but you know you like you can drive a car without needing to know the engineering and the physics behind building it right and but ultimately the same is true for money right like uh you know you just use money um and it shouldn't be that big of a deal it only starts becoming a big deal if the money turns really really bad um um but if you know if if there's a sound money on the market 
you just use it and go on with your day, right? And you're, hmm. I don't know, a carpenter, uh, you know, producing cool furniture and you get paid and then you buy food from the butcher and, and all that. And it just, you know, it just works. Um, so uh, like for, for, we don't all need to become Bitcoin developers and Bitcoin designers and stuff. Um, uh, however, I mean, if you're bored, if you don't know what to do, uh, if you're eager for solving some serious problems, I mean, you know, what better could there be? Uh, maybe that's just my personal unique situation, but I feel like that this is the most worthwhile thing to work on. Um, so it's it's not just a great tool per se, and, and I love using Bitcoin or wielding Bitcoin, uh, mm. but building it is... is uh, even better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and as you say, money and savings should be basically very boring and very uneventful. <laughs> this is not the state state of matters we are just in right now. When even the developed countries have like five percent CPI inflation and the monetary one, the issuance is even higher, and everybody's just looking to speculate or spend as fast as possible. That, that's crazy, and we should just. Uh, be productive and just save up our our product, our fruit of labor, and just focus on things that matter, not on finance, not on money. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I've got a question here uh, via a direct message, uh, and that's a good question for you. Is it possible to coin join very small amounts of Bitcoin? And I believe you touched on that with the Wabi Sabi protocol, and you said uh, actually outputs of several thousand Satoshi are possible with Wabi Sabi. And I'm not really sure how that works and how economical those out outputs are going to be. Yeah, so, so in theory, again, a coin join is just a, a Bitcoin transaction with multiple inputs from multiple different people. And, and a valid Bitcoin transaction is, well, I guess anything above the dust threshold of what, 64 sats or something like that. Um, so, you know, as long as it is a valid Bitcoin transaction and as long as multiple people own the inputs to that transaction, it's a coin join. Right? The, the question is, is there software that does that nicely? Right? Um, and the Wasabi 1.0 was not that software. Uh, and why? Um, because as I said earlier, right, the zero link coin join coordinator is a very limited um, whiteboard, right? And on the output side of the, of the coin join transaction, the coordinator predefines uh, the same amount of Bitcoin for, for every user, right? So every user gets at least zero, one time 0 0.1 Bitcoin, right? And then if you have more money, you get 0 0.2 Bitcoin. If you have more money, you get 0 0.4 Bitcoin, right? Um, uh, but the, the user couldn't choose that, right? The user couldn't write his own unique amount there. Um, the coordinator pre-described it. And so, well, which value should the coordinator use? That's an impossible question to answer, right? Because, well, everyone has different amounts of money and everyone wants to make different value payments. And this is a highly subjective uh, value. Um, so what happens if you make the value way too high? Everyone needs to have at least... Uh, like everyone gets 100 Bitcoin output, which means everyone needs to have at least 100 Bitcoin inputs. And uh, I, I mean, I don't have 100 Bitcoin. I, I lost all of those on a tragic voting accident. <laughs> and so I'm unfortunately out of that round, round of coin and I'm excluded. Right? Uh, so that's the problem. But uh, if, if it's too high, what if, what if the uh, minimum denomination is too low? Right? What if the coordinator says, okay, the 100 Bitcoin is way too much. Uh, now everyone gets 1,000 sat uh, output, right? So that means 100 users get 1,000 sat output, and then uh, most of them get a 2,000 output, and most of them a 4,000 output. Uh, you know, it, like, it takes a lot of outputs to decompose 100 Bitcoin down, you know, if your base denomination is 1,000 uh, sats. Right? So that just means you will have thousands and thousands of outputs, uh, and who's going to pay the fees for that? Uh, I don't have sats to waste on that, sorry. Right? So. Um, that's the inherent problem, right? And that's why we had to choose on some just arbitrary amount. Um, in, in the zero link paper, I think this was 10 Bitcoin and, and later got down to one Bitcoin. And then we implemented it uh, with 0 0.1 Bitcoin, just arbitrarily chosen, right? But it still sucks. Um, and so with Wabi Sabi, again, the difference is the coordinator is now this shiny empty whiteboard and you get to write both your address and the amount 
in the output side of the coin join board and and um that has the benefit that um no longer every user needs to have the same um and that means the coordinator no longer needs to prescribe a certain minimum threshold right if one user wants to register 100 uh, bitcoin in the output side cool right and if another one wants to register like nobody else needs to register 100 bitcoin right the the user can do that all by himself um, uh, so even if I have less than 100 Bitcoin, I can still be in the same coin joint round, right? Because I'm no longer forced to be in the same round as the other, the same value as the other people. Uh, but same in the lower value, right? If if you want to register a thousand sats, um, then uh, you can do so, right? But you're going to be one of the few who registers that low of an input uh, or output, sorry, and um, not that. So you have to pay the fee for it, but the others don't, right? Um, so the the philosophy of zero link and Wabi Sabi is different, uh, at least in the implementation of Wasabi's case. Um, that uh, in zero link, the coordinator pre-described the output values, right? and uh, that had this these these huge consequential problems with it. Whereas in Wabi Sabi, the user chooses uh, the output amounts, um, and therefore uh, the there, like the the concept of minimum denomination no longer makes sense, right? And therefore, the actual minimum denomination is really going to be tiny. Like, I mean, you know, less than a hundred sats doesn't make sense, but a thousand sats or something uh, surely does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for this explanation. So, unless there's someone wanting to come up and join the discussion or ask some other question. Uh, I don't see anything in my DMs nor the Trezor DMs. Uh, I guess this is a good point to end our discussion. So thank you very much, Max. And I urge everyone to look at Max's webpage towards liberty.com where you can contribute to his book uh, The Praxeology of Privacy and we are definitely looking to forward to Wasabi 2.0 with the Wabisabi protocol and in the future sessions I would like to talk with people that are from countries where fiat currency actually no longer works anymore in terms of store of value and medium of, medium of exchange. And there are multiple countries with collapsing currencies right now around the world. Lebanon, Turkey, Venezuela, Sudan, and a couple of others. So if you are from this country or you know about someone from these countries, I, I would really love to talk to you in this way. And I already got someone arranged for the next session from Lebanon. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, because in this format, I would like to just talk to people from all walks of life and all kinds of countries and just explore how Bitcoin is perceived and how Bitcoin is used all around the world. So thank you very much, Max, for your time. Thank you very much, Josef, for, for the invite. It's a really cool topic to talk about. I'm really interested to hear the, the next conversations um, because uh, Bitcoin is a very beautiful tool that's extremely actionable in the here and now and can actually be used to make a substantial impact uh, on, on your life uh, and, and to live fiat free. Uh, this is now an option and the consequences of, of making that choice are uh, fun. <laughs> so I, I hope more, more people get fiat free and I'm very eager for the beautiful things that we can build uh, with such dedicated peers. Thank you for those final words. So everybody live as fiat free as possible. It's going to pay off right now and in the future. So have a nice evening or have a nice day wherever you are and looking forward to next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.